What's up, everybody? We back. R2C2. New week. What's good? You know what? See, I love a recording like this because I have a live audience. My daughter is behind the screen just looking at me, and she's so fascinated when I talk in <laughs> podcast mode. She's just like fixated on me. She's, uh, she's locked awesome. in that. It's the best. Can you believe she's six and a half months already, man? Man, like, it goes by quick, man. Oh, my gosh. I'm saying this talking to a dude who has a son about to go to college. Like, <laughs> no, nah, it goes it, by fast. I'm telling you. Oh, it goes my by gosh. It is, it is nuts. It's just like, it's wild. And I can fully see how I'm going to cry at all the dance recitals like you said I would. <laughs> like, whatever, <laughs> no doubt. <doubt-out. laughs> whenever they come. Whenever they come. Um, so how was Tampa, man? How was, oh, uh, how was coaching? Tampa was good, man. It was good to see everybody. Um, you know, get down there and kind of mix it up with the guys I hadn't seen. I hadn't been to Tampa since the pandemic, you know, since the, uh, since everything started. That was the last place I was at. So to get back down there and, you know, see Monty and Pixie and uh, Aaron and all the guys, uh, it was good, man. I wish I could have stayed a couple more days. Little C had a, a tournament down at IMG, so I was only able to go to Yankees for one day. So maybe I'll go back down uh, – I don't know when, bro, <laughs> but hey, hey. I, I don't know if I'm going to get back down, but I'll definitely be at the stadium a lot this year. Yeah, man. Um, I know you've got a, you've got a busy, busy march. Uh, R2C2 is going to take its show out to Arizona again, mm-hmm. uh, do some great pods. Um, really looking forward to that. Um, and uh, I'm going to be in the midst of the women's tournament for a lot of that, but C is going to hold it down with some very special guest hosts. Um and I'll pop on for intros and outros and whatnot, but I'm excited for so – we won't reveal them yet, but you're going to have some awesome guest hosts uh, for R2C2 while you're out there and and getting to do some in-person stuff, which is great. And I think that was part of like the thrill of seeing you back in a baseball uniform as well, See, It felt like a return to normalcy, man. Yeah. You, you're, you're back for the first time since pre-pandemic. You know, you're in a uniform for the first time in a while. I think – do we need to get you thinner pants now, though? Oh, I mean, man, my, it... pa- my pants situation is terrible, man. I got <laughs> I got all my Yankee stuff that I have from before. I need, I need to get redone. I need Robbie uh, to hook my shit up. But, yeah, no, it, 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 it is. To, it, it's good to be back in person. It's good to see everybody. It's good to be, you know, around baseball again. And I'm just looking forward to the season to start now. So um, I think, you know, getting the CBA out of the way and the lockout, I think that's kind of behind us and, I think everybody's excited for baseball. And we're only going to miss a week. You know what I'm saying? So, And no um, games. And no games. So it's good. Yeah, I think it, they came back quick enough that there's going to be no lingering negative feelings about what transpired. I, I think the only way that would happen is if you had, like, some sort of flurry of injuries that, you know, happened because of an accelerated ramp up. Then, then all of a sudden I could see people maybe, and you know, end up getting upset. But otherwise, I think... It was solved quick enough. Thank God for the good of the sport that it won't be that worry. See, how about when you're there in spring training like that? Like, what's your what's your focus as someone who's not a formal member of the coaching staff, but is a formal member still of the organization, but obviously not in the capacity that you were, but you're really well respected by the team. You have a lot of wisdom. Your teammates are still there. What's your approach when you go into a situation like you were just in in spring training? Just for me to go in and, and just hang out with the guys, just have fun and, and uh, you know, talk to the guys, see what they're thinking. Um, got a chance to talk to Sevy, see how he felt. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with Monty. Obviously, I think everybody knows that. Um, I had never met uh, Jamison Talion before, so I got a chance to meet him. Um, you know, hadn't seen uh, Greeny and Britt in a long time. So just going in there and chopping it up with all the guys and just seeing how everybody's feeling. Um, you know, if I had more days, then, you know, I'd be able to like watch guys bullpens, give my opinion on different things, but, um, just being able to go in and hang out and mix it up, um, and show my face, um, I think was the biggest thing for me this spring training. What did you have any like big takeaways, just getting any kind of feel from the guys who you were around, uh, or, 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 or is there even an ability to kind of to feel a personality or an identity around the team in that short of time? Or, no, or what? it was, it was yeah. too short a time. And, um, you know, I think, I, I mean, you know, I think everybody was still waiting for some moves to be made. You know, obviously yeah. while I was there, Luke was still there. So 
he ended up getting traded. So, I mean, you know, with all the free agencies out, with all the free agents out there, and still kind of trades to be to be made, I think people are just waiting to see what their final product is going to be. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, e- even uh, still, you feel like there's a feeling like that, even even today. Uh, maybe not today. I mean, maybe after Luke got moved, it, it might have changed. Um, yeah. But you know, you're just waiting to see, you know, what, how everything's going to shake out. If there's is going to be any other relievers coming in, are you going to get some starters, anything like that? So, um, but no, I think everybody, you know, the mood of the camp when I was there is just everybody's excited to be back on the field. Yeah, you know, be back together and and uh, talk to the coaches, talk to the trainers, you know, because they can't do any of that stuff during the lockout. So, um, yeah, I think I think the mood, you know, while I was there, because it was still it's super early in camp. You know, they hadn't played games yet or anything like that. So it was just everybody was excited to to be back together. You know, I um I'm excited for us to talk with Ken Rosenthal, um, because he's such a you know great baseball insider. I know you've you've had a good relationship with Ken for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um and uh and to get his thoughts on, you know, free agency moves that were and weren't made. See, I this is a good time for us to kind of dive into it, at least the Yankees offseason as of, you know, March 22nd and um and and where they're at because I think a lot of a lot of Yankees fans are are very displeased with them not bringing in you know, some of the big names that were available, especially after seeing them sign for maybe smaller prices or or shorter years than were expected, namely Correa, right? Seeing Correa sign on a three-year deal, uh, you know, with multiple opt-outs and thinking like, okay, well, you know, why wasn't that an option? Um, I think, you know, has left a lot of Yankees fans feeling a little disenchanted. Same thing with Freddie Freeman, seeing, oh, he only got six years, six you know, years. and- and like he could have been had. Trevor um, Story got six years. Trevor Story got six years. I, I I have to say this though, I am I have no problem criticizing, and and we've done it on this pod many times. Like moves that the Yankees do or don't make. Mm-hmm. The only place that I feel right now, like I I am certain they need, but there but there's not the obvious fit to me is like another top end star starter. Yes. Yeah, I, I know they need another top end star. But, but then, but, I, but but for me, but I don't know who it is. Yeah, but it, it could be Sevy. I know. You know what I'm I saying? Know, I know. And I he know. looks really good, man. Like I, I've yeah. been, I, I've been watching him. I, you know, on Instagram or whatever. And then I saw him playing catch, and I got a chance to see him throw a bullpen. He, he looks and he and he looked good in the, in the game the other day. He looks really, really good. So that that other top end starter could be Sevy. You know. Yeah. Um, Especially if if Talion comes back healthy, um, Monty keeps progressing, um, and and his uh, you know and, and as a pitcher as a, as a big leaguer, um, I think he may be okay uh, if you can go with those four and and Nestor can give you some innings at the at the at the at the five. You know, I, I just feel like that's been a place where they've been missing for a lot of years now, right? Yeah. Like needing one more top end starter, and but but I will say. Like there wasn't an obvious free agent starter this off season to go get and and be that number two. I don't think. Am I missing someone that there was an obvious number two starter that was no, out there? No, but the but or the A's, A's have caliber? guys out. The A's have guys you could definitely trade for. So and that is the sort of like could that shoe still drop? Could could you end up making a deal with the Reds or the A's for a top end starter? That is the thing you're still waiting on. I, I will say this though, like. The, I, I, there's a couple components. One, Anthony Volpe, the organization is clearly extraordinarily high on, right? He's I didn't get number- a chance to see him, but I saw Peraza, no. though. Yeah, how did he look? He looks really good. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have, you have Anthony Volpe, who's the number eight prospect in all of baseball, then Oswald Peraza, who's the Yankees' number two prospect, who I think Peraza is a top 50 prospect in all of baseball. Um, so you have, you know, two guys that the organization's really high on. If you like, these are the tough decisions as an organization, right? Like if you know, if you're, you have more Intel on these guys than any of us do. If you have true conviction that these dudes are the goods, like then I get holding on to them, but you better be right. That's all. That's all. If you're not, you have a window to win right now. When you have judge in his prime, Stanton in his prime, Cole in his prime, if you are holding on to those guys, 
and not making a deal that's going to increase your championship chances this year, okay, but you better be right. Yeah, like, and- you, you better be right. And maybe there's a difference there between Peraza and Volpe and who you're trying to protect more, but I, I, I'm okay with that if you're right. If you're wrong, that's a big miss. Yeah, and it just reminds me of that year we could have traded for Cliff Lee. I think it was 2010 or maybe even, I think it was 2010. Yeah, um, so it looked like the deal was done. Remember, like, and, but they yeah. didn't. They didn't want to trade Nooney. Remember, it was like yeah. a big deal where they they didn't want to trade Eduardo Nunez, and and yeah. and look where that got us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> I mean, you never know how these prospects are going to turn out. I mean, they prospects. We call them prospects because I mean they ain't worth the shit right now. It's just all potential. So you never yeah. know how it's going to shake out. But you're right. You better be right if you don't, you know, go out and try to, you know win a championship right now when you have these pieces in place and you have pieces to trade to get, you know, to get better pieces on the board. And, and look, maybe part of it is also saying like, I want to see how this team performs. Let, let's, let's give, give a runway during the regular season. And then if we need to go get pitching, Hey, guess what? We have the assets that we could then deal them in season. And, and I don't think that's, I, I think that could be a prudent approach because if Sevy does look like an ace with Cole, you might end up looking at it and saying, like, you know, and let's say Volpe or Peraz is tearing up the minors again. You may look at it and say, you know what? I don't think we need to deal one of these guys for Frankie Montes or Sean Manaya. You know, we we we're better off hanging on because they're they're not going to move the needle as much as these guys eventually will. So I'm actually okay with that if you want to take the beginning of the season and evaluate, that's fine. But if you end up hanging on to him, you better be right. Now, yeah. to me, like the Correa one is the one that I think might stick in the craw a little bit more because you could have gotten him on a short-term deal where even if you feel like you have your shortstop of the future, which, look, shortstops can move around. We've seen that you know, a million times in the history of baseball, including this organization. But even if you feel like you have your future 15-year shortstop or whatever – Correa for a year or two could help you win now. You know, that's yeah. the one that I wonder if they'll, you know, if they'll regret. Uh, and I'm interested to get Ken's perspective on that when he joins, because maybe, maybe they would have jumped at that if his term was shorter when they were in conversations rather than after they made the trade for falafel. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it, 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 it had to, it, that had, couldn't have been an option for the Yankees. You know what I'm saying? Like right, that, like, that, that, right. that wasn't on the table for the Yankees when they were in their talks with Correa, for sure. And and then, but I'm just trying to figure out like, what the fuck are the Twins doing? Like, <laughs> what are you guys doing over there? Like, are you trying to win? Or are you or are you not trying to win? Like, I, I mean, I don't I don't get it. But I mean, we we'll have to see and wait how, and see how it plays out. But just in that division with the White Sox and them kind of being like mid-level, like they're they're signing guys and making trades, but it's just like, eh, are we trying right. to win? Or are we you just going trying for to, it or you're not? They're yeah. just trying to put some asses well, in the seats. You know what I'm saying? Like, Well, one thing I think is like that, that Correa also does for them, though, that gives them one heck of a trade tra- trade chip uh, in season as well. If they if they say, see things aren't sunny. going that way. Sunny, sunny too. Yeah, yes, exactly, yeah. Sonny is the guy who should have been that number two starter with the Yanks for all these years, man, if it would have yeah. worked out. Uh, and if you guys haven't heard our conversation with Sonny uh, from recently on R2C2, go back and listen because he really talks in depth about kind of wanting to get back to a big market and um, you know the tools he has to deal with it this time around. But see, I was gonna, what I was thinking is, like one thing, I, I, I'm going to defend the Yankees here. And some skeptics will say, like, oh, you're defending them because – you know, you do their games or whatever. I don't really care. I'm, I'm well reasoned in everything that I say, and in this case, I believe I'm well reasoned. I don't think it's fair to play the look at free agency and play the the Yankees don't spend money anymore card. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's right. You know, when the Yankees targeted Garrett Cole a couple years ago, when they knew he was what they needed. They were going to spend whatever money it took to get him yeah. because they knew it was what they needed. They went to $324 million. They gave him the biggest contract a pitcher had ever had, right? Like, do I think they're more fiscally conscious than they have been in the past? Of course they have. But I also think some of that is also trying to make sure they can build a sustained winner and not get saddled with nine contracts that are eight years long 
where you're getting crushed on the back end at once. I think there's a little yin and yang there. And if there was a definitive number two starter this offseason that was available or ace that was available that just cost dollars that they weren't spending money on, I'd feel differently. But I don't think that guy existed. And so sure, it was Scherzer. I guess Scherzer. I guess Scherzer. Scherzer would have been that dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right, see. Scherzer would have been that guy. So if you want to say that, like in the Mets were willing to spend that money and the Yankees weren't, I guess that is fair. That is fair. But I don't like I I don't think that I think that their offseason has been underwhelming and it's it hasn't been particularly exciting. And I totally get the fan base being like yeah, none of these moves jazz me up for the season. That I totally get. I 100% get. But I also think the jury's kind of out on like whether or not it's been a bad offseason because I do think you needed to move on from some pieces, rearrange things a bit, and they have done that. You know, Kiner Falefa, who we may just call Falafel, like he, you know, just for ease, like he brings defense, right? He brings more speed. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's going to be the fit they need around the other boppers, you know, at short. Donaldson is a live bat and a good glove at third base if he's healthy. You are deciding to finally move on from Gary at short. You do have more now definition with first, with Luke not being there, with Rizzo back, who was great last season, is incredible defensively. Having Hicks back, although we know he's been hurt a ton and it's hard to rely on him, that is your switch hitter who's a really good defender in center field. And you do have Severino back. So I, I don't feel great about the offseason, but I understand kind of wanting to evaluate at the beginning of the regular season and seeing what it looks like before you deal Volpe or Peraza. Does that make sense? So you think that's fair? Or you think I'm giving them a little too much of a pass? No, no, I think it's fair. And I think that I think they also are probably thinking, like, what is this team if it's healthy? Hasn't yeah. been healthy since since they made that run to go to the to the ALCS in seventeen. So the team hasn't really been healthy where all these guys have been playing. Now, is it kind of dumb or like should we be counting on them to be healthy? If right, they haven't, right. you know, like maybe that's a question that we can you know dive into it with the organization. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that they think that this team is really good when healthy. If you put it out there and you look at it on paper and the way that. You know, the lineup is constructed right now. They feel like they can compete. Um, you know, as far as them spending money like they did before, this is another one that's going to be in the newspaper. But I think it's the Ellsbury effect. Like, they can't just go out and give somebody fucking seven years, a hundred, whatever that, that shit was, and yeah. not have them play, cuz. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think they are being a little more smart about who they give this money to, for sure. Yeah. I, I I totally agree, C. And I think that um I think that you make a really good point about the health. Because if you look at the lineup with if it's healthy, if you have LeMayhew, Judge, Stanton, Rizzo, Donaldson, uh uh Kyle Hicks, Falefa, Hicks, Hicks yeah. Ga Gallo, I mean Glaber. Yeah, Glaber. I mean, that should be a ridiculous no, offensive the, the, the team. The lineup if it's should. Healthy. If it's healthy, that yeah. lineup should be one of the best. But yeah, you also got the fucking Red Sox who got a great lineup. You know what I'm and saying? The, and, and the Blue Jays and got the better. Blue too. Jays got, got a yeah. lot better. So yeah, it's yeah. it's a tough division, man. This division yeah. is going to be really, really tough. Um, so you know, as usual. Well, with that in mind, we want to bring in one of the absolute best uh, when it comes to baseball insiders. Ken Rosenthal going to join us now on R2C2. All right, see, we get to chat now with uh, senior writer from The Athletic, MLB on Fox dugout reporter, one, one, of the, one of the great insiders when it comes to baseball um, for a very long time now. And you know he's special because he's someone you always talk about with enthusiasm, see? Whenever we've we've talked about Ken Rosenthal coming on R2C2, you're always like, yeah, I love Ken. You don't feel that way about every reporter, you know? So <laughs> This is <laughs> you, true. <laughs> you, you, you know it's special. Ken, welcome to R2C2, man. Well, I'm flattered, and thanks for that, CC. Ryan, good to be with you, man. Uh, it's great to have you. Ken, uh, we were just talking about the Yankees um, and their offseason, and it's funny because I, I'm always conscious of the fact that, like, yeah, I do games for them. Obviously, C has a role. So if we defend them in any way, 
it's kind of like, oh, of course you're defending them, but we're critical too. So, um, but in this case, I actually look at their off season and I say, like, I, I think they, I, as much as it hasn't been like inspiring, it's been kind of meh. If I look at their lineup, I'm like, if they're healthy, that lineup should still be great, you know? I, and I'm just wondering, like, if there was, other than Scherzer, there wasn't an obvious pitcher to me that they definitely should have gone and signed, right? Correa at the, the short years, maybe that would be the regret. If you look at the way things shook out with free agency and where guys signed, is there any one transaction they missed on that you feel like they will regret uh, this year or in years to come based on how it actually ended up playing out? I don't know that I'd go so far to say that they're going to regret anything because we don't know how these things play out and they frequently play out differently than we thought. Not every free agent is CC Sabathia killing it for the entire contract. <laughs> so the one question I have, the enduring question to me is the exchange in which they acquired Donaldson and kind of Falefa and the catcher and yet did not get a combination that they could have had, which is Correa, Gary Sanchez, and Giro Shella. They could have done it that way, mm. but they chose the path that they chose. Now, that's the comparison that I'll be making or thinking about as the season goes on, the years go on, because I get that they love their two shortstop prospects, Volpe and Peraza. All right, I understand that, but Correa on a short deal, that's what this is. This is a short deal. He's going to opt out after one year as long as he's healthy. And that would have set up perfectly for the Yankees. Now, maybe there's a reason. Maybe they didn't see that short deal materializing in the time frame, and they felt they had to go get Donaldson and address shortstop with Kiner Falefa. I understand all that. But in retrospect, as we look at this unfold now, they set this up for the Twins by taking Donaldson's money creating yeah. financial flexibility for Minnesota. And that's the thing that I wonder about. Freddie Freeman, yes, he would have been great too, but I don't know that Freddie Freeman wanted to come to New York. I, I mm. never got that impression. And it's just one from afar. I never spoke to him about that, but he's from Southern California. It would seem to me he'd prefer to be there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I never got the feeling that Freddie wanted to come uh, up north either. I just, you know, I thought it was either going to be Atlanta or um, LA the whole time. But I think... I think that trade, I think they really wanted kind of Falafa more than they wanted Donaldson. I think that the Twins made them throw that in there, take the money, and it gave them flexibility. But I think that they really thought kind of Falafa could help them, um, you know, until one of the shortstops came up. But, you know, you had to throw Donaldson in there, and then that's where you get, you know, then Geo's out, and then now DJ has nowhere to play. You know what I'm saying? That's the biggest thing for me is I think DJ gets hurt with his app, you know, and everybody wants to talk about his offense and, you know, high is going down, but he was playing second base every day when he first came. You know what I'm saying? I think I think people don't understand how hard it is to move around the field. You show up to the field one day and you don't know what position you're playing. I think that makes a, a takes a, a big toll on your offense. So I, w I would love to see him be able to just play in one spot, and that's not going to happen this year. CC, I'm with you, and you're absolutely right about having to take Donaldson's money to get kind of Falefa and Ben Rodford. Okay, I understand that. And listen, Donaldson, we both know this. Ryan knows this too. He's a really good player. Yeah. He's had some calf issues, not last year, but in the past. And that's a concern. But again, when you're looking at that combination, Correa, Gio, Sanchez versus Donaldson, kind of Falefa and Rutherford, that's where I don't know it's going to come out okay for the Yankees. We'll see. We'll see how yeah. it plays out. Yeah, that that's the interesting thing. Ken, I, I, I the Correa one on the short term is the is the thing that I think – will um, you know, stick in the craw of Yankees fans, especially because if you sign him, you're not, if you sign him to a three-year deal, you're not thwarting the path of Peraza or Volpe, right? But I'm wondering, how recent was that development, do you believe? Like, was that something on the table for the Yankees in talks, you know, with, with Boris about Correa? It's a great question, Ryan. And I believe it was really recent. In fact, okay. right down to the end with the okay. Twins and perhaps other teams. I wrote about how Boris contacted the Braves and offered them the same structure, the three years with the one-year opt-out and the two-year opt-out. So by then, yes, the Yankees had acted. So maybe when they made the Donaldson trade, that avenue was not available to them. And I don't know 
whether they explored it or not, whether they tried it, whether Boris presented it, that's kind of the missing thing here. But there is value to patience in the free agent game. And often when you wait, in this circumstance especially, maybe things will have developed that you didn't anticipate. Now, that's dangerous too because Mm -hmm. then you may wind up with no shortstop, which is what they're most concerned about. So these things are never black and white. They're never that clear cut. But as I sit here on the outside looking in just as a journalist, that was the thing I wrote about. That was the thing that still kind of bugs me about where they went. Yeah. I I also wonder this, Ken. Like, why didn't Correa get the eight-year, you know, $35 $35 million a deal a year deal. Like what it, it, he would see, I mean, he's still so young. He's accomplished in the playoffs and the regular season. You know, he's coming off probably what his best defensive year ever at shortstop. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, you know, obviously he's, <laughs> I mean, he's just a, an absolute menace at the plate. What, why, why didn't he, why didn't someone throw that money at him? That money, let's say eight times 35, yeah, I believe that would have been available to him. I don't know that he was getting the three fifty, and I what I believe he wants. Now mm. we've seen this with the shortstops, and CC can speak to this because I know players think like this, and I understand it. Mm. But they look at salaries as competition and an evaluation of their status. So Tatis at three forty, Lindor at three forty one. I knew he'd be at three forty one or above, <laughs> and Correa wants three fifty. Now for Correa. The good news is it's not over. And basically what he's doing is buying time. It was a crazy spring training. It was a crazy circumstance. Now, everybody else, the big guys, did get paid. They all got good contracts. Schwarber, mm-hmm. Castellanos, Brian especially. But Correa will go back into the market if he chooses at 28. And at that point, if he gets, I don't know, 10 years, 350, then it's a really effectively an 11-year, 385 deal. And he gets what he wants. So that seems to be the plan. Maybe that 350 wasn't available to him now, but maybe it will be next year when Xander Bogarth and Trey Turner also are free agents. So it complicates things a little bit. (laughs) It's going to be interesting next year as well. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. You're right. I mean, he is looking at their salaries and like, oh, yeah, I need to get paid more than them. I've done more than them. I've won a championship, you know, so he's, he's trying to get, uh, he's trying to get more than Tatis and Lindor for sure. What I was surprised was Schwarber got got paid so much. Four years, $80 million. I was like, I mean, I know him and K. Long, you know, were great in, in Washington, and now K. Long's in Philly, so I expect him to do well. But, man, that's a lot of money um, for basically a DH, right? It was a good deal for him. There's no doubt, CC. And how about Castellanos, 100 for five? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He, too, is basically a DH. So – the Phillies are loading up on offense. They have a very interesting roster construction. Put it that way. CC, I don't know if you'd want to be pitching for that team with the way they're <laughs> going to catch the ball. But, but at the same time, Schwarber, with what he did last year before he got hurt, it seemed like he turned a corner in his oh, yeah. career and became the player we all envisioned him becoming. And yes, Kevin Long, big part of that. So, I understood that one, and there was a lot of action on him. The Blue Jays were in. A lot of other teams were in as well. And when he received that contract, I thought, okay, that's about where I thought, based on what I was hearing, it was going to come in at. But, yeah, he's not really a defender. Castellanos is not really a defender, and it's going to be quite an interesting team going forward. Yeah. Ken, to go back to Freeman for a moment, um, hey, how – like? Where he landed, I think you know many people thought, "Hey, he's going to want to go home if he's not staying in Atlanta." And but where he landed, money wise, years wise, how surprising or not surprising was that? And and is it is it in any way a, a tell of what you know could be coming in the landscape of you know free agents moving forward? And I say that kind of uh, to say like six makes some sense to me, right? Like I. More so than like, hey, I'm, I got to give this guy eight years if I want him. Like, I know I'm getting taxed on the last two years, maybe more than that. Like, six feels like a place where, yeah, you know what? You, you may get pr- good production for all six, or you might at least for four of the six. Like, hey, was that 
Was that surprising? Could that be a portent of things to come in free agency? How do you kind of evaluate what Freeman ended up getting and where he landed? Six is what he wanted. So mm-hmm. ultimately, that was okay. one of the causes of the rift with the Braves, that they wanted to do five, he wanted six, and was adamant about six. Now, what's interesting about the Freeman contract is the way first basemen are now perceived as opposed to, say, 10 years ago. Going back to the Teixeira contract, let's start there. He got a big, long deal with the Yankees. Miguel Cabrera, Albert Pujols, Chris mm. Davis, you can throw in there, Joey Votto. Chris These Davis. guys got long, Wow, big you're right, deals. yeah. And now mid-30s first baseman or early 30s first baseman are not valued the same way. So we saw Goldschmidt get a five-year, $130 million extension from the Cardinals. That was in the spring of 19. He was about where Freeman was age-wise then, or maybe a year younger. I can't remember exactly. So Freeman was going to be in that range, and he ended up in that range. So from that perspective, not surprised. I am surprised the way it went down, and that he didn't go back to Atlanta. Everybody in the industry is surprised by that. Were you surprised that the Braves pulled the trigger on Matt Olson? Was there any talks of that? Like, I hadn't heard any rumblings of him getting traded to the Braves, and it's just, I've never, I mean, I'm just trying to think of another time in the sport when a team has basically lost their franchise player and the the, the franchise can, can replace them with a, a better option. You know what I'm saying? A younger, just as good option. I've never, I've, in the history of free agency in baseball, like when I've been paying attention, I've never seen a team being able to, to re-up like that, you know, in one move so quick with, with losing a franchise player. Well, CeCe, there was talk of Olsen before this all went down. And in fact, I thought the whole time the Braves were weighing one against the other. Now, what's really interesting, we talked about the Yankees situation, how that will play out. The Braves situation, too, versus Freddie is going to be really interesting. Olsen versus Freddie. Because remember, they gave up four players for Olsen. Then they paid him $168 million. Freddie, if they could have paid him and kept those four players, would that have been better for them? We don't know. We'll see. Mm-hmm. So that was always something that they were considering. In fact, they talked to Oakland before the lockout and those talks were fairly serious. And Oakland knew the whole time that if the Braves thought they weren't going to keep Freddie, they were sitting there with a kid from Atlanta, a really accomplished player, excellent player. He's not Freddie, but he's, gr- he's, he's, he's really good. good. Yeah. yeah. So they knew with a guy four and a half years younger, that was a really good fallback for them. And, they paid a steep price to get him, but ultimately they end up in a pretty good place because the money they saved on the Olsen Freeman exchange just for 2022. Olsen's 15 million. Freddie's going to be 27. That enabled them to do some other things. And we saw them do Kenley, McHugh, and it's pretty impressive the way they kind of put their team back together. Mm-hmm. How about, Ken, just to, you know, because obviously we love diving into Yankee things with Olsen. How close or, or do you think the Yankees were or weren't on being major players to potentially get him? They were in there, Ryan, from what I understand, but I don't know that anyone was going to match the Braves' desperation. And gotcha. that often drives these things. And desperate is not a word that Alex Anthopoulos would want to use. He would say, oh, I wasn't desperate. We were just doing it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but if they were going to lose Freddie, they had to come up with a good alternative and Rizzo would have been a good alternative he of course was out there but he's not Matt Olson in terms of age and potential and being from Atlanta the whole thing so Mm -hmm. it seemed to me the Yankees were fighting an uphill battle on both those fronts Olson and Freeman what about right now Ken what what do you expect to still happen if anything with the A's and their their pitchers. I'm also curious about the Reds and the way they're selling off, but we could start with Oakland. Like, do you, do you think Montes and Manaya get moved before the start of the season? How do you see this playing out? I'm not exactly sure, Ryan, because I thought perhaps they'd be gone by now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do expect Manaya to be moved before the start of the season. Montas, I'm not as sure about. And I'm just kind of trying to read the tea leaves here and who knows? Montas might get traded by the time we're done taping this thing. <laughs> kind of the way things work in baseball. But it seems that the A's maybe are kind of staggering this a little bit. I'm not quite sure what their strategy is. But 
do I expect both to be moved by the deadline? That is probably a safe assumption. Yeah, got you. What? How? Like, I'm I'm wondering for. It, it, do the Yankees have what it takes farm system depth wise to get to get a pitcher like that without dealing Volpe and Peraza without dealing either of them? Um, you know, it, in any deal for a top end starter, are they going to have to include one of those two prospects? I don't know, Ryan, but my expectation is no. And I would think you can put a package together without including one of those guys unless you determine that Volpe or Peraza is the guy. We're not going to have both in our lineup. Let's do it now. Or maybe you say, let's try to build this without one of them. And then we preserve the right to trade them for one of them for somebody else. There are all kinds of ways to look at it. Now, I would imagine... Oakland's going to be pretty adamant about wanting one of those two kids. They've got yeah. Elvis Andrews at shortstop, who is at the end of his career. I just don't know how that will play out. And I would expect the Yankees will do everything possible to preserve both of them and to re- retain their flexibility going forward. Maybe both become stars for the Yankees. Maybe one gets traded for an even bigger pitcher than Frankie Montas. There are all kinds of scenarios. And it's a fascinating thing when we assess this stuff and evaluate it and look at it. The options that GMs have and what they consider and the way they look at these things and the moves that they ultimately make, it's so fascinating. And it never ceases to be fascinating. And I know fans maybe on Twitter will say this, that, and the other thing. Oh, they put cash for this or Billy Epler that. <laughs> I get it. Not quite that simple. <laughs> <laughs> they're, de- they're definitely going to be asking for one of those guys just because they know that they're you know highly touted in the organization so i mean why not ask for one of you know one of the guys that right. you love i think they could have put together maybe if it would have been luke and anduhar or some you know what i'm saying like they have enough big league guys extra big league guys now that they um you know with with anduhar not having having a position to play they could have put you know those two together and maybe traded for one of the starters in oakland CC, I just don't think Oakland wants guys who are making any money. Yeah, and they, they want the cheaper guys, the guys that can come up for three years, pay them the minimum, and then get them in arbitration. Versus Luke, who is about five million this year, yeah. and I believe is free after this year. Maybe Ryan, you can correct me. Maybe no, I think he's, he's got, got one more. He's got one more. One more, okay. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's five, and then maybe eight. Eh, Oakland doesn't want to deal with that. They, they're going to be at like some ridiculously low number, 40, 45, 50 million in payroll. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other, I guess, conversation with, I Man. mean, is there, Ken, is there a light at the end of that tunnel at some point? Like if I was an A's fan, gosh, your your patience has, I mean, I know you know the drill by now. You've known the drill for basically 25 years, right? But it's just, it's unbelievable Ugh. the way they fire sale over and over and over again. Is there any sort of, you know, is there any sort of path away from that for the organization or any repercussions that would keep that from happening? The new ballpark is the path. I was about path. to say, them moving to Vegas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah, the new ballpark, either in Oakland or in Vegas, and it's going to come. In fact, I have to get this right. The CBA has a stipulation where they're back on the revenue sharing plan. They're getting phased back in. They were taken off, but they're getting phased back in, yet they need the ballpark in place wherever. I believe the date is January 1st, 2025. I'm not exactly sure. It might be 24. So there is time pressure on them to get this done now. Otherwise, they lose their revenue sharing money while they're waiting for that stadium to be built. I expect that is going to be the path forward. And I don't know where this stadium gets built. I'm not that familiar with all the politics yeah. going on in Oakland. I, I think they had something good happen the other day, some kind of ruling that will perhaps enable this thing to happen. But that's what they need. And there's certainly room in the Bay Area. I don't need to tell CeCe. There's two teams. There's plenty of people oh, there, yeah. plenty of great fans. I'd like to see it happen there. And then baseball can maybe pick ex- expansion in Vegas and somewhere else. But... I don't know how that's going to play out, but certainly the path to getting to be a respectable yeah. franchise 
lies with that ballpark, which, by the way, as you said, we're, we've been hearing this for 20 years. Oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's been, I mean, since I was a kid, they've been getting a new, since the Raiders <laughs> moved back, they were supposed to be getting a new stadium. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I think the best option would be for them to go play in Sacramento for a couple of years and build another stadium right where that stadium is. Like, right where Oracle and the Coliseum is at, you got all of that land. You can turn that into batter the battery in Atlanta. You can put a little terminal right there. The BART runs back there. The airport's right there. The freeway. You got all this different access to that that landlock right there. Like, they should rebuild the stadium right there. So, I don't mean, that's just me. I mean, for me, with my Raiders no, moved to, o- to Vegas. So, I would love them to move to Vegas. I think they've ruled it out, though. They For some reason, they don't want the Coliseum site. and I. I'm not, again, as well-versed on this stuff as I probably should be, but they want that waterfront site up closer to the city. And it is a beautiful rendering they came up with. And if they get it done, it's going to be one of the coolest parks going. But I'm with you, CeCe. There are ways to get this done, I would think, either at the Coliseum site or the Hudson Terminal. That's the other one. But, Mm -hmm. man, (laughs) it's been dragging. It's crazy. Uh, Ken, how about Michael Conforto? What is going on with Conforto? What yeah. what do we expect to happen there? Not sure. And there's always one or two free agents who are the last to go. It's just the nature of it. Conforto's coming off a tough year. And yeah. he's a really good player, but that platform year, as they call it, was not what anyone would have wanted. So I'm sure he's going to get a representative deal. Maybe he takes a shorter deal to go back out on the market next year, like a Correa type thing. Honestly, Ryan, I don't have a lot of information on it. I'm not sure exactly what is going to happen. with him. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird to see because it feels like we're hearing nothing about it. Um, Ken, how about just like looking at the landscape of the league? Who, if you were, you know, you're looking at teams you expect to take a big leap this season in the American League and National League. Who would be a couple that come to mind? The Blue Jays would come to mind. And yet, yeah. I just wrote this, too, as a note today because somebody pointed it out to me. And this person said, it's a baseball official. He said, hey, you guys are all excited about the Blue Jays. Well, Matt Chapman, is he that much better than Simeon? Probably not better. He's not going to have a year that Simeon had last year. And then... Kikuchi and Gossman, are they going to be that much better than Robbie Ray and Steven Matz were? These were valid points. And the other part of it is the Blue Jays have younger players who are maturing and coming into their own. And then beyond that, they're going to play the entire season in Toronto. And for me, what they did last year, Dunedin, Buffalo, Toronto, that did not get enough play in terms of the degree of difficulty, the extra degree of difficulty that they faced. I mean, it was ridiculous. CC, I wonder if you can even imagine that kind of schedule and going through a season like that because, to me, it was a huge disadvantage for them. And for them to have the season they had without making excuses, just kept playing, it's pretty impressive. The only reason they were able to do that is because they were young. They, they all had just come out of Dunedin, Buffalo. You know what I'm saying? Like, they had no problem going back to Buffalo because they didn't know any, any – if it had been a veteran team – they would have been complaining. We would have we would have been hearing about it the whole time. It would have been a mess. But the fact that they were so young and just happy to be in the big leagues, like they they you know what I'm saying? They were able to to get through that. But that is ridiculous playing home games in three different places. Like that that's unheard of. So yeah, you're right. It didn't get enough of enough play about how how difficult that is and how they didn't complain not one bit. Because I would have been bitching the whole time. Like, <laughs> I would have been bitching the whole time. So the fact that they never complained, just went out and, and put their best foot forward every day um, just shows you the resiliency of that team. I think, you know, I think they're, they're going to be really good. But you're right about Gosman and Kikuchi. Um, I do think Matt Chapman, um, over the course of him being a Blue Jay, will turn out to be better than Marcus Simeon. I really like Matt Chapman, but... You're right about the pitching. The last time Gosman was in the American League, it was in the AL East, and it didn't go so well. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's interesting seeing like some of these teams, right, who have added quite a bit, but also lost quite a bit, or have been kind of in and out. C was talking about earlier with like a team like Minnesota. It's like, okay, are you trying to win? Are you going for it? Or are you? 
<laughs> not going for it. Like there's kind of like you're okay, you're acquiring some pieces, right? But you're also giving up some. Um, and I forget the other example you you see of another team that was sent, taking a sort of similar path as them. But um, but yeah, because to, for Toronto, I do think people forget they what they've also lost from last year, Ken. In addition no to doubt. what they've gained, and Minnesota is a fascinating team right now. They finished last last year. They yeah. were really among the game's biggest disappointments. So I expected maybe they would take a step back, but they gave Buxton the extension, which in my move, in my mind was great for both. Buxton gets some security. He can go play. Hopefully he stays healthy. We want him to stay healthy. He's one of the most exciting players any of us will ever see. And then from there, you saw what they did. They've kind of <laughs> piecemealed it. Dylan Bundy, Sonny Gray. And then in the end, after they make the trade for kind of for Leffa, they figure out a way to get rid of Donaldson's money and they bring in Carlos Correa. They clearly do not want to take a step back. They want to compete. And perhaps the extra playoff spot plays into that. Perhaps it's just the mindset of their ownership that, hey, we are not going to a tanking mode. We want to keep going in the AL Central because they've been so good for so long. And last year was a bit of an aberration. They had some very unusual things happen last year in the community, of course. They lost their bench coach, Mike Bell, 46 years old, right before the season started. It just never got on track there. So they like their core players. They feel they have young pitching coming. And they're going to build around that, which is what they've done. We'll see. Again, it, these things you never know. But they are really an interesting team, just the way that they've gone about it. And they only have really one team to compete with in that division, and that's the White Sox. You know? That's right. I feel like the Indians in, the, in Kansas City are so far behind that they're like, hey, we, I mean, we could challenge these guys. You know what I'm saying? If, if they didn't make those moves and the White Sox ran away with that division, you know, easily. So, and Detroit's you know, coming. Detroit's, Detroit's coming better. too. Detroit's coming. Kansas too. City yeah. is okay, but they're not there yet. See, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, that is the division where I, I can't imagine conceding, even though teams have conceded in that division. Yeah. Let me ask you about the, the AL West with uh, Correa being out of Houston. Now I feel like that opens up the West a little bit. Maybe Seattle can step in and maybe win that division with all, with all that young talent they have. What do you think about that? That is an interesting division too, and. Seattle's moves, I'm not so sure about Eugenio Suarez and <laughs> Jesse Winker. Jesse's a really good player, obviously, mm -hmm. and he's going to add to them offensively. But they had expectations for more. Remember, we were talking about them and Chapman and Bryant and Story. The question that their fans have is whether the Mariners did enough and whether what they accomplished last year was a bit of a mirage or whether it's a sign of things to come. Remember, they had that crazy run differential where they were kind of outplaying it and it didn't really make sense. So that team is sort of one that has to still prove it for me. Mm -hmm. Houston is still the class of the division. Texas, yes, they added two great players and a few others, but they're a ways away, in my opinion. And I, I don't see it there. And then you have Oakland going the other way. So it's going to be an interesting division for sure. I still see Houston as being the team. The Angels, I forgot them. I forgot now them they too. Have, <laughs> they have two of the best players in the world. They just spent $92 million on the Leavers. They had better be improved. And Man. I'm not sure it's going to happen. Noah's coming off the injury. Lorenzen is kind of a risk in the rotation. At some point, they're going to have to figure it out. Maybe this year with all those relievers they added, but I don't know. It's still hard to I, like them. I completely forgot about Anaheim or LA. I completely forgot about the angels. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting too, because you think about it and having just those two dynamic, you know, historic talents and just not being able to build around them, obviously trout for a much longer period of time. But I mean, yeah, what is, I guess, Ken, what is the feeling uh, around them and, and, and what's been, like, where are they falling short there? What, why, why haven't they been able to, to build properly around these historic talents? Brian, if I had the answer to that one. <laughs> pitching, pitching, pitching. They ain't never had pitching no pitching. Like pitching. But I'll go above that. The owner. 
Yeah. And they've been inconsistent with the way they've gone about it. Once in a while, you'll see them pop a big free agent, whether it's Albert, Josh Hamilton, Rendon. Often it doesn't seem to add up, but Artie wants the star at that moment and he gets that star. And yet they don't build a team around that player or Trout for that matter. And yes, it comes back to on the field pitching and their shortcomings there. And that goes into evaluation, player development, scouting, all of those things. But if you look at it, they've had a number of general managers. The Poto, Epler, and now Paramanesian. What's the common denominator? It's the owner. Mm. And, and they, they, let, they let Garrett Cole walk right out of their backyard. You know what I'm they saying? Did. The kid grew up there, like born there, wants to pitch there, and they let they let him they let him come to the East Coast. So they do stuff like that. Yeah, and it's, the funny thing is, Garrett Cole wouldn't have been enough there. They no, still he need four have. more. Yeah, and, and, you're right. Yeah. And I, you're right. I think Garrett saw that, and I, I don't know yeah. what their offer was. I don't recall exactly. Yankees made an amazing offer to Cole, mm-hmm. but at the same time, <laughs> I was going to be short even with Cole. Yeah, for sure. Ken, what do you expect from the Mets this season? Oof. I don't know, but it's going to be entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I expect they're going to be better. I, I yeah. think they're going to be real. And yeah. I say that in large part because of the manager. And mm. Buck Walter, yes, he can wear out people over a long period of time. Yes, I understand it. But he is extremely extremely competent, skilled manager who will get the most out of players. He did it in Baltimore with some teams that were not at the Yankees level in terms of talent and others, but that's who he is. And that's going to be the glue that I think makes a difference for them. Remember, they had Mickey Calloway, they had Rojas. These were inexperienced managers. They were not necessarily ready for that job. Now they've assembled all this talent and I like the guys that they've brought in, not just from performance standpoint, but also makeup. These are good guys. Marte, mm. Kana, these guys are come to play legit effort pieces. Lindor's going to be better. DeGrom, knock on wood, is healthy. Max is Max. I just believe that they're going to be a really good team. Now, are they as good as the Braves? They've got to prove that. I don't believe they are. But I can't watch, wait to watch them play. They're going to be a fun team to watch. Yeah. They're going to be a story, too. I mean, that's one of the things, too, about having, you know, this owner who can become a supervillain in the scope of baseball. Like, watch out. He'll spend whatever he wants to get your player. I mean, there's there's something fun about having that. And I think there's something needed in the New York market as well, Ken, to have, like, the Mets take on that persona and to have this owner who's willing to write the check that you know the Steinbrenners have forever, um, and 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 turn them into like I, I think you're right. There's something about them this season that they're just they're going to be really interesting to watch, and I, we haven't yeah. been able to say that in a long time. Right, I totally agree. And the owner is acting like the owner Mets fans wanted for years and years and yes. years. He drove Mets fans crazy that the Yankees would do these things. And they're sitting there with the wool ponds and they're only going to a certain level. They'll pay certain guys, but not others. And it's never quite what it should have been for a New York team, a team in the biggest market in the country. So now the owner's flexing it and he's getting players and we'll see how it all comes together. But one more point about Showalter. A lot of the side shows that we've seen from the Mets over the last, I don't know, 10, 20 yeah. years, the, the extracurricular BS for lack of a better term. Show Walter should be able to control that. In fact, I'll, I wrote this and I'll say it here too. That Lindor McNeil thing last year, whatever it was, I don't believe that happens under Show Walter. He nips that in the bud before anybody ever knows about it. And those kinds of things, he will bring it on himself. He'll take care of it. So from that perspective, they should be in a better place. Yeah. I think any experienced manager in that situation with those two guys would have been able to to tame that a little more than, than they were able to last year for sure. Ken, is there a is there a big name that we haven't mentioned that you think could move at some point during the season, if not before? Is there someone to watch out for as far as like, you know, any team goes that 
It's like, hey, if their season goes one way, look out. Or like this player could end up, you know, changing the balance of things. Ryan, when you first asked that, I thought to myself, man, I'm just trying to recover from what's been going on the last <laughs> couple of weeks. <laughs> I, can't I know, like I that. know, I know. <laughs> so I'll give you one name. It just came yeah. to me. It's not a surprise name because we've heard his name, but Luis Castillo from the Reds, mm. I would think at the deadline, he'd be a guy that could be out there and they're not going to be that competitive. I can't imagine. And well, the other one would be if the twins stumble, yeah. Correa. Carlos Correa. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but that is one option for them. If they stumble, like I said, they trade him, get the draft pick back that they lost, equivalent of the draft pick that they lost or better, and they just go from there. Ken, how about, you know, just, you know, one or two about, you know, you've given us such great information, but just about you and how long you've been in this game and, you know, your, uh, the way you cover this sport. Where's your love of baseball come from? Covering the sport, Ryan. And it's funny. I am not like Buster Olney, Jason Stark, and Tyler Kepner. I can name three. Those guys grew up wanting to be baseball writers. I didn't care what I became. I thought if I could get to cover any major professional sport and be the B person for a team, that was what I wanted to do. I came out of college in 84. That was my goal. That was my only goal. So it just so happened that my opportunity came in baseball. I worked mm. for two smaller papers than the Baltimore Evening Sun. Of course, rest in peace. <laughs> that <laughs> paper hired me in 1987. And I had the extreme misfortune of competing against two of the best. One of them going into the Hall of Fame this year, Tim Kirkchen. The other was oh, Richard man. Justice. <laughs> These guys crushed me and I was forced to learn. But as I learned and as I talked to people around the game, that's how you get better. And I came to love it. And I love the fact that when you cover the sport the way I do nationally now, it's 30 reality shows taking place over six months. Every team is like a reality show. And it's fun. It's interesting. And the people in the game, and I get the privilege of talking not just to the players, but scouts and agents and front office people, all kinds of people. They're all different. They come from all different places. And I love that part. That's my favorite part of it. My favorite thing that I do is Friday afternoon when I'm at the ballpark getting ready for a Fox game, talking to all the players. Because it's the people that make this thing go. And it's the stories that you want to write about the people. Now, we write a lot about other things, too. And all kinds of other things. Lockouts yeah. and... God only knows what, but that's what passion because I love, I love being at the park, love being around everyone. And even after all these years, I've been doing it now a long time. <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't diminished my fire or anything like that. That's awesome, man. That's when you know you're doing what you're meant to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I believe that. You know what, Ryan? Actually, I believe that. I was meant to do this. And <laughs> the other part of that is, I don't know what the heck else I would have done. <laughs> <I'm pretty lucky. laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. How, how about can, if like, if you do get a moment of an off season as someone who has to be very entrenched in free agency and movement, when, when does that time period typically come? Let's say in a non CBA year. Um, like we just had and like and what do, what do you like to do what's ken rosenthal's like wind down like doesn't come in a normal yeah. year honestly yeah and what i generally do is take a week off around christmas time even though the front offices are doing their thing still they don't observe holidays and then i take a week off in august uh, after the deadline that's it mm. and Am I entitled to more from my job? Sure I am, but it's yeah. just impossible. <laughs> and it's just the way it is. Now, the lockout <coughs> kind of gave us something that we haven't had. I'm talking about baseball writers in forever, this room to breathe. Mm. And that first weekend, I have relatives, quite a number of relatives who have Michigan ties and Iowa ties, both those universities. And I went to the Big Ten Championship game with my wife which was nice. awesome. we, we, we just decided, well, let's go. And we had like 15 family members. There. It was so much fun. And music is my other thing. I, if I had time, 
I go to three live shows a week and oh, all different awesome. kinds of genres. I, I don't, I just love seeing live music. And, uh, and I have, of course, favorites like anybody else, but that would be the thing that I would do most. And actually, <laughs> I shouldn't admit this, but <laughs> I love watching YouTube videos of bands and groups and just seeing how they do their thing. I just am fascinated by that. That's that awesome. is awesome. So have you ever gone to a Pete Caldera performance on the <laughs> yeah uh, at, at any point during covering the Yankees? I have not gone to see Pete do his Sinatra thing. I've seen yeah. him sing, I believe, the anthem at the baseball writers' dinner, maybe. And okay. Has he done it at the stadium? I can't recall. I don't, I don't know if he's done it. I don't think stadium. he has. I don't think so. But Pete is so. legitimate. He's oh, yeah. a legitimate singer. It's really yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. for, for, Pete, Pete has you know, covered baseball in this area for so long. For anyone listening who doesn't know, look up YouTube Pete Caldera and like Frank Sinatra, Pete Caldera singing. You will be blown away <laughs> by this man's pipes. He is incredible. Incredible. It really is amazing. Ken, you're terrific. We both are such admirers of your work and so appreciative yeah. of your time and information sharing today. And um and cool to hear some of your background as well and uh and and good luck making it to that week uh finally in, exhaling in august man in august <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks guys hey i just want to say one thing before i go and one part of the job that is really cool is when you cover people that you see from the start of their careers and you see how they grow and their ups their downs and you enjoy talking to them well cc was always one of them and he was always great with us good and bad very fair and open and honest and it was a privilege cc i just want to say that publicly i think i've said it to you privately at least oh, well, yeah. probably not that much but <laughs> I, I mean it and, and there's certain guys cc was always one of them that you just said man I, it's a privilege to cover that guy no i appreciate that and i always appreciate our relationship and you know you've always you know just been, been a great guy to me you know ever since i came up so i, I appreciate that a thousand percent thank you thank Thanks, you guys. ken Thank you so much for the time, man. We appreciate it. All right. Talk soon. Thanks, guys. You got it. (laughs)